this road. It's kind of fun to drive. It all started on this quad country road that became a crime scene in no time flat. Oh my God. Oh my God. A wild ride in a speeding 8,000 pound truck with a drunk teenager behind the wheel playing chicken with other people's lives. Four innocent people dead. There's another child in the ditch. It was carnage. Carnage and destruction. A perfect storm of wrong place, wrong time. I started screaming, where's my dad? Shattered lives and a fancy defense for a rich kid. Affluenza. Too pampered for prison? Affluenza. Affluenza. It's la fluencia. This is preposterous. When a teen with blood on his hands and money in his pockets didn't serve jail time. I am sickened by this judge. Up to that point, life has just told him, you can get away with it. The question on everybody's mind, where were his parents? Tonight, they are here with their son, for the first time on camera, answering from the hot seat in exclusive deposition tapes. Tell us your name, please, sir. Ethan Couch. Tanya Couch. Frederick Anthony Couch. Did they shower him with everything except the word no? A case of affluenza. Good evening. It was the single word that set off a national firestorm in a case settled just last week. Affluenza, the so-called illness that a defense expert said should keep a rich teenager out of jail. Outrage not just at the teenager, but at his mother and father as well. One magazine cover actually branding them the worst parents ever. Tonight, decide for yourselves here when you hear from them under oath for the first time anywhere. Here's Matt Guppin. Take I-35, 20 miles south of Fort Worth, and you arrive in Burleson, Texas. A land of big houses and big trucks. What kind of people live here? Probably just the good, average, middle-class, hard-working folks. Get up every morning, go to work. It was the night before Father's Day, and Eric Boyles was spending it with his wife, Holly, and daughter, Shelby. Shelby and, and Holly called out and said, Eric, come here. When I walked through the door, they were standing at the window to the front. Out in front of the house, a young woman driving a white SUV had spun out and was now standing by her disabled car. So the girls headed out the front door. The driver of the SUV called for help while Shelby and Holly waited with her. That same night, down the road from the Boyles' house, Lucas McConnell's family was hosting a party organized by their youth pastor, Brian Jennings. He was one of the closest people that I had who wasn't family. I was around him all the time. Around 11 p.m. with the party winding down, Brian needed to return some tables and chairs to his church. Lucas and a friend jump into the back of Brian's white truck and they head down the road that would take them right past the Boyle's house. I remember we saw a car on the right-hand side of the road and he decides to pull over. It was that disabled car along with Holly and Shelby Boyle's standing on the road with the driver. We're trying to get out of the car and he tells us, he's like, no, y'all just, y'all sit tight. I'll be back in just a minute. With Brian Jennings on the scene, there are now four people by the side of the road. Meanwhile, a third location, just a few houses down, there's another party in progress. But this one's not so innocent. 16-year-old Ethan Couch is there with seven friends. They're drinking, they're having a good time, and then the young woman um, needs to go to the convenience store. So they decide, well, we'll go get them. All of them? All of them decide to go. Eight teenagers load into Ethan's souped-up fire engine red pickup. Six in the cab, two in the flatbed, and head on out the road. Ethan guns it, hitting nearly 70 miles an hour in seconds. His truck barreling toward the scene at the Boyles family mailbox. Chance is bringing together a crowd of people whose lives are about to violently collide. Eric Boyles is inside when his world changes forever. I felt, you know, we don't live in California, but it would almost think, you'd almost think you just had an earthquake. I mean, the house shook. When the red pickup truck packed with eight teenagers, two in the flatbed, lost control, it swerved into a ditch, sideswiped that disabled white SUV, then mowed down those four bystanders, crashing into Brian Jennings' white truck before flipping over into a tree. These photos show what remains of the Ford F-350 that Ethan turned into a weapon of mass destruction and Brian Jennings' accordion white Chevy tossed across the road. The bodies had been scattered hundreds of feet. 
At the moment of impact, Lucas McConnell was seated in the back of Brian Jennings' parked white truck. Do you remember the sound of metal crunching, of glass breaking? Glass breaking, tires screeching. The car that we were in got hit, and we got shot across the road. We nailed a tree. The back window was completely shattered. A lot of that glass was in the back of our heads. Just seconds later, Lucas's father, Kevin, part of a caravan coming back from that party, pulls up on the scene. I see tail lights up ahead. As I got a little closer, I see debris in the road. And I'm thinking, that's not a party, that's a wreck. The debris in the road that I saw was the chairs that we had been taken back to the church, and my heart just sank. I was like, oh my God. Eric Boyles is in his house when he feels the explosion, rushes out the front door to where he left his wife and daughter. He starts dialing the phone. I was on the phone with 911. Okay, County 911, what is your emergency? Uh, there's a multi car accident out front of my house. While Eric's on with 911, half a dozen other frantic calls come in. There's four or five kids, there's kids laying in ditches and streets. Are you with the accident right now? Oh, my God, oh, yes, there's another child in the ditch. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We've got one laying on the road unconscious. They say he's breathing. There were already people out there in front of the house. It was just debris everywhere. There table and chairs and car parts and everything else. I walked in the road, and the first thing I did was I found there was a, there was a male laying in the road, wasn't moving at all. Between the four people dead in the street and the 10 injured in the vehicles, the casualty count is staggering. It was chaos. There were people lying around, injured, hurt, dead, people yelling, screaming, help me. Eric Boyles was yelling for his wife, Holly, and daughter, Shelby. I'm calling out Holly and Shelby as I walk, and I kind of got halfway between the road and my fence. And that's when I found Holly. And when I found her, I mean, there was no doubt that that she was gone. And then it was a matter of, okay, so where's Shelby? As Eric stumbles along, searching for his daughter, about 20 feet down the road, he sees a young woman, her body thrown up against the fence. Well, everything told me this should be Shelby. It didn't look like Shelby. And I'm sitting there trying to process the amount of trauma the bodies went through and, and what would the impact be and, and what would that do to you? At the same time, on that same dark road, Kevin McConnell is also searching for his friend, youth pastor Brian Jennings. On the other side of the road, I see Brian laying in the ditch. I ran over there. So you're on the ground to tend to Brian and suddenly hear what you think is the voice of your son. Yes. The truck. I just heard his voice, and it was just at that moment that I realized that Lucas had been in that truck with Brian. Right as we got out, we realized that it wasn't just us. There was people everywhere, and then we saw Brian. I tried to feel for a pulse. I didn't feel a pulse. And I pull out my phone. I'm calling 911. Sir, how many people are injured? Do you know? Uh, one, two, three, multiple. Multiple? I don't even know how many. My dad said, just hold this fence right here and just pray. You can hear Lucas's terrified voice in the background on that call. It's Brian. I need you to sit here and I need you to pray, okay? Oh, my God. Come here. I need you to sit here and I need you guys to pray, okay? Do you remember what you were praying for? Brian's safety. About that time is when the other cars from the party started getting there. Brian's wife, Shauna, arrives on this hellish scene. Yeah, it was a normal drive, and then all of a sudden I saw teenagers walking down the side of the road, and my first thought was, why do people let their teenagers walk down the side of the road? It's like almost midnight. Shauna pulls over and realizes there's been a crash and her husband was involved. I really thought, okay, he got hit, but he's gonna be okay. And I'm thinking, God wouldn't do that to me. But her faith is tested by what she finds farther down the road. I saw him and I knew that it wasn't good because I could see that Kevin was um, doing CPR. And by now, Shauna's three children are also on the scene. I was just crying out to God. I was like, please save my dad. I need him. You can't take him yet. I'm not ready. The first EMT or firefighters they got there, they were just so overwhelmed. They would just walk down the road and, is he conscious? Are they conscious? Are they conscious? The scene was 
as bad, if not worse, than anything I've seen. And that's 35 years of law enforcement. Because it was a huge crime scene, spread over hundreds and hundreds of yards. Tonight we're hearing the chaos in the moments after a truck full of teens. Slammed into three cars, killing three good Samaritans. And a woman with a flat tire. The chain reaction crash happened late Saturday night. It's almost like watching a movie. It's like it's not happening to you. And it's just surreal and it's not, it's not real life. <laughs> but it was. When we come back, the 16-year-old who was behind the wheel of the red truck has left the scene. Does he really think he could just walk away? He was like, yeah, just remember my name. I'll get you out of all this. He kept saying that. Stay with us. Once again, Matt Gutman and 2020. The carnage out on Burleson Redder Road looked like a plane crash. Four people killed instantly. Over a hundred onlookers, first responders, and victims' families like Eric Boyles jamming the street. I've never been in the military. I've never experienced war. But I can appreciate what they go through. Local news crews capture this footage. Authorities scanning through the wreckage. They needed to find the person responsible for the crash. As it turns out, police wouldn't be the first to do that. What condition was he in? He was unconscious. Corbin Clark and his mother, Shauna, two neighbors heading to the scene, find a passed out teenager in a ditch a quarter mile down the road. And I kept saying, hey, what's your name? What's your name? He said, what's your name? And he said, Hey, man, I'm, I'm Ethan. I can get you out of all this. I was like, I guess he thought I was involved. But he was like, yeah, just remember my name. I'll get you out of all this. He kept saying that. His name, Ethan Couch, is now one everybody in Burleson remembers. Somehow, he not only survived the crash, but managed to free himself from the mangled truck. And rather than help anyone, he walked away. The police came. And they, they said, we need to get you in that, into an ambulance. Was he struggling with the officers? He kept trying to shake them off, saying, I don't need all this. Once Ethan Couch was found, the story came together pretty quickly. That shocking story would turn sadness into outrage. Get this, Ethan's a 16-year-old living the life of an adult by himself just seven doors down from Eric Boyles. Ethan was supposed to be cleaning up the place so it could be sold. Where were his parents? Well, Fred Donya Couch had already moved on up to this sprawling place in Fort Worth. A 7,000 square foot compound. Take a look at that glittering metal roof. You're looking at the Couch Moneymaker. Fred's got a multi-million dollar sheet metal business, and this estate is complete with guard towers, guest house, and a steel gate surrounding it. But the story of the crash begins to be told by Ethan's blood alcohol content. It comes back three times the legal limit for an adult. And that's three hours after the crash. Now understand, this is three hours of time he had for his body to clear alcohol out of his system. Speculation, what his blood alcohol was at the time of the accident is through the roof. As Ethan awakes in a hospital bed, the sun also rises over Burleson Redder Road. It is Father's Day. The next day, yeah, I find these packages where my Father's Day cards have been filled out. And my Father's Day gifts were there. I bet they were gone. There was no, no preparation, no time to say goodbyes or anything else. Out in front of Eric's house, investigators are still sifting through the crash site. Wreckage that spans almost a city block. And seven doors down, officers pay a visit to Ethan's Burleson house. No one's home but a trash bin brimming with cans and bottles right outside paints a vivid picture of the last night's activities. So not only was he drunk, but there were traces of THC, Valium, and some other drugs. Right, which according to our toxicologists, um, were bad enough on their own, but you combine those with alcohol, just a recipe for disaster. Richard Alpert is an assistant district attorney who came onto the case just a day after the crash. The first thing we started doing is bringing those witnesses in and talking to them. Will you please state your name? Garrett Ballard. Star Teague. 
Garrett Ballard, Ethan's best friend since grade school, and Star Teague, a former and brief love interest, were two of the teens in Ethan's red truck that night. These are never-before-seen deposition tapes from a civil lawsuit resulting from the crash. Star says Ethan, Garrett, and another boy started drinking around 6 p.m. the night of the crash. Uh, all three of them did a shot of vanilla. I don't, I don't know what it was. So they start drinking, taking some shots, and then they decide to go pick up some friends. So on the way back, they decide well, we want to get some beer. So there's already alcohol at the house, and Ethan clearly has money, but they decide it'd be more fun to steal the beer. At the Walmart, I went in, grabbed the beer. This is surveillance video from that Walmart. Sure enough, there's Garrett Ballard and four other teenage boys. And then we walked out to the fire exit. Ethan stayed with the vehicle, and when the other five stole the case of beer, they actually ran out the exit door. The teens head back to Ethan's empty house, and the drinking continues. Not just beer, but shots of the 190-proof grain alcohol called Everclear. And then the young woman um, needs to go to the convenience store. But even the other ones who'd been drinking knew Ethan had too much to drink, and they tried to talk him out of it. And he would have none of it. It just made him angry. With that, all eight teenagers pile into the truck. With Ethan Couch behind the wheel, right away, things start breaking back. Pulls out of there and immediately is going so fast that they're at the start. It's telling them to slow down. So his response is, well, I'll just drive into oncoming traffic. So he starts playing chicken with a car in front of him. I was yelling at him, get over, get over, you're going to get over. And when he swerved, the back tires jerk. I just remember seeing something in the road and then a loud bang. And I remember being in the air. The vehicle was going about 68 miles per hour. Had Ethan ever pumped the brakes? No brakes. Never touched the brakes? No evidence of braking was there. You know, your brain, when you're that intoxicated, doesn't work the way it should. And at that point, I thought Ethan was dead. Uh, so I freaked out, and uh, I got out of the truck. I climbed out the back, and I guess I had tunnel vision. I just walked out. I just took off. But for Ethan Couch, walking away from the consequences of this accident wouldn't be as easy. Not with this prosecutor determined to hold him accountable. I don't know if Ethan's life is salvageable. And quite frankly, I don't care. But this guy's about to give him the shock of his career. I think Ethan Couch is suffering from, uh... Stay with us. We return to 2020's A Case of Affluenza. More than a thousand people gathered in Burleson to remember a youth pastor killed on a Tarrant County road last weekend. I'm gonna live to make my daddy proud. The memorial for local youth pastor Brian Jennings drew so many mourners it had to be streamed online. While crowds were mourning in Texas, Ethan was in a West Coast resort town. Ethan was at a spa-like treatment center in California. Welcome Newport Academy. Its promotional video shows Sunset on the Fire Pit, Equine Therapy, and Yoga are parts of the program. Rehab that cost him's dad nearly a hundred thousand bucks. We're talking about him living in luxury even while he's being treated. Ethan's parents, meanwhile, were trying to figure out how to keep their kid out of prison. They quickly assembled the best criminal defense team money could buy and what a memorable defense it turned out to be. When did you first see Ethan Couch? Well, it was about two hours after we got home from the hospital. This is Dr. Dick Miller in another deposition video. Now, he's a prominent psychologist hired as part of that powerhouse legal team. Well, I think Ethan Couch is suffering from adjustment reaction to adolescence, I would say. What Dr. Miller was learning in his meetings with Ethan would come to shape this story. That throughout his young life, Ethan's parents showered him with everything except responsible parenting. Ethan learned you should be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. I think that was the message generally. Before too long, we realized that we weren't dealing with a typical juvenile. 
or typical parents. The couches definitely had plenty of coin, and for Ethan, that meant every day was Christmas. Nintendos and jet skis as a kid, later, a tricked out truck, even his own credit card. Instead of the golden rule, he was taught that we have the gold, we make the rules at the couch household. I said that. Those rules included traffic laws. For Ethan, there weren't very many. His parents happily handing over the keys of their trucks to their 13-year-old. Something that, at the time, caught the attention of one of Ethan's teachers. And what did she say? Mrs. Anderson said he's not allowed to drive to school. And what was Fred's response? Something to the effect that I'll buy the school or something along that line. And Impulsive. What he did, and when he didn't buy the school, he pulled Ethan out of the school. Yes, he did. After that, Ethan's parents opted for homeschooling. It's not clear how much schooling he actually got, but he definitely got the home. As in the 4,000 square foot ranch house, he frequently stayed at just down the street from the Boyles family. These pictures from the website Zillow show a wet bar in the den and a swimming pool out back. And if his parents weren't around, sure seems that alcohol often was. From the friends we talked to, the one thing they admitted very early on was that Ethan was no stranger to alcohol. I think one night we went through a 30 pack just between us. Roughly 15 beers apiece. Probably about that. Ethan's buddy Garrett even admits to seeing him drive drunk on at least three different occasions. There was history there. There absolutely was history. There was history and warning after warning of this was going to happen. For prosecutor Alpert, enough was enough. It was time for young Ethan to get a dose of reality. Up to that point, life has just told him, you can get away with it. We were going to make sure he didn't get away with this. And he charged Ethan with everything he could, including four counts of intoxication manslaughter. Alpert wanted the poor little rich kid to do some big boy time. We were hoping for and asked for 20 years. When Ethan Couch loped into court, the selfie swagger from Facebook had been replaced by this. Brian Jennings' daughter, Abby, couldn't believe it. They made him look really innocent for the trial, and that's not who he was. But it turned out there would be no trial. Ethan Couch admitted guilt, and the proceedings moved directly to a sentencing hearing. He really didn't look at anybody. He just kind of sat there, basically stared off into space. And now we come to the key moment in this case. While recommending treatment over incarceration, Dr. Miller drops a curious term. Affluenza. Which goes off like a bomb. Affluenza. He got up there and he talked about the fact that the reason for this crime was he was a child of privilege and his parents didn't say no to him. When you heard it, what did you think? I smiled. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous. I looked to my mom, I just kind of gave her a look. It seemed like a made up word. We all agreed he had terrible parents, but at some point, offering up that because he was raised as a rich kid, he didn't know the difference in right and wrong as a result of affluenza, just kind of blew our mind. And they were in for an even bigger shock when Judge Jean Boyd announced her ruling. Ethan Couch was sentenced to 10 years probation and time in a rehab facility. Four dead, nine injured, and not a single day behind bars. WFAA reporter Jim Douglas covered the case. What was the reaction? Volcanic, mainly aimed at uh, Judge Jean Boyd, longtime juvenile court judge here. She really never even got through with her Senate scene. The place kind of lit up, and the bailiffs escorted her out pretty quick. I felt like the judge spit in my face. The media crushed to get a shot of the boy who cried affluenza. To me, it's not right. He'll be feeling the hand of God. Money always seems to keep Ethan out of trouble. Ethan's lawyer had a different take. We applaud Judge Boyd for, for having the courage to issue this sentence that's going to give 
Ethan Couch a chance. Now, even in a law and order state like Texas, it's not uncommon for juveniles to get rehab instead of hard time. Still, the affluenza defense and judge's sentence lit the national media on fire. Well, a verdict in Texas sparking new outrage. Shockingly light sentence in a deadly drunk driving case. Affluenza. Too rich for jail. Judge Gene Boyd said the teen wouldn't get the therapy he needed in jail. I am sickened by this judge. People wanted this judge's head. They just felt like there had never been consequences in this kid's life. And here's one more example. No consequences. Judge Boyd wasn't the only one in the public's crosshairs. So was Dr. Miller, who took to CNN to defend himself. This kid has about an 80% chance of becoming a full functioning citizen. If he goes to the jail, he has about a 10% chance. I mean, he killed four people. I, mean, I really don't think that. Are... I wish I hadn't used that term. Everyone seems to have hooked onto it. What he didn't anticipate was that the BS of what his opinion was was going to be hit the winds and he was going to get the reaction he got, which he deserved to get. So many people were now asking, did Ethan Couch's affluence actually buy him a slap on the wrist? Maybe and maybe not, because for one family, the case was far from over. Not so fast. This is not the end of this. They were about to force the couches into the hot seat to answer tough questions under oath. When's the last time you recall disciplining Ethan for anything? You're going to want to hear this. Stay with us. Once again, Matt Gutman and 2020. If Ethan Couch's affliction was excessive wealth, the victim's families were eager to provide a remedy. Five of the families involved in the fatal crash brought civil lawsuits against the Couches and their family sheet metal business. While Ethan was spending eight months in a state-run rehab getting well, the Couches settled those suits without admitting any wrongdoing. Never once has Ethan um, apologized in any shape or form. But one family announces they're holding out. I've yet to see anything good come out of it. The McConnells, remember, they lived down the road from Ethan's old booze binge pad in Burleson. 15-year-old Lucas was injured in the crash. Now they are determined to have their day in court. I thought, not so fast. This is not the end of this. So when your parents told you that they decided to go through with an actual court case. What did you tell them? I was ready for that. A lot of people were ready to hear something they'd never heard before. The boy and his parents at the center of this story speak. Tell us your name, please, sir. <clears throat> Ethan Couch. Tell us your name, please. Tanya Couch. Please state your name. Frederick Anthony Couch. It fell to lawyers Greg Koontz and Todd Clement to extract the peculiar family history that shaped young Ethan's life. His parents seemed like, you know, regular old Texas parents in, in some ways. Yeah. There's nothing regular about the couches. Fred Couch, a rags to riches millionaire, has his own history with the law. And get a load of what he allegedly said during a 1992 stop for, you got it, a DUI. Did you tell the arresting officer I make more in a day than you make in a year? Probably. Fred and Tanya had an on-again, off-again marriage, the second for them both. The kind of fractured family life which might require extra care for an only child entering adolescence. Instead, these lawyers say the couches let Ethan fast forward into adulthood. People don't allow their kids to drive at 13. You understood if he was, at any time he was under 16, he was never to be driving by himself. Yes. Nevertheless, you allowed that behavior to happen, correct? Yes. I just kept asking if I wanted to. And eventually they started letting me drive just <clears throat> like the corner store by myself. And then that progressed to school? Yes. Fred Couch admitted allowing Ethan to drive, but both parents say they didn't know about his regular drinking. Have you ever seen Ethan drink as we sit here today? I don't remember ever seeing him drink. Maybe not, but she 
definitely saw him drunk. Just four months before the fatal crash, 15-year-old Ethan was stopped by police at 1 a.m., relieving himself in a parking lot. Fort Worth officer comes upon him. He's taking a pee outside of a truck. There's a half-naked 14-year-old girl passed out drunk in the car. And this 15-year-old kid is just mouthing off to this officer, using profanity. His mother shows up, starts talking to him. So she clearly knew he was out there. Did you ask him where he got the alcohol and the vodka that was in the truck? No, I should have, but I did not. Why didn't you ask him where he got it to try to stop it from happening again? I don't know. These attorneys say Ethan Couch wasn't even old enough to drive, was violating as many as five laws that night. Five violations of the law, and nothing's done by Tanya. Well, not quite nothing. Tanya does admit to concocting a story with Ethan to keep her husband in the dark about the more criminal details. I wasn't sure how he would react, so I didn't tell him the whole truth. Tony told me that Ethan was peeing at the Dollar General. What action did you take? Ethan walked back and forth to work for a month. Oh, really? Do you remember any occasion where your dad punished you by making you walk to work? No. I don't, I don't remember ever having to walk to work. Ethan was required to complete an alcohol awareness course and eight hours of community service within 90 days. Guess what? Didn't happen. We didn't do the community service. You understood, did you not, that he was likely to continue the drinking and driving if there weren't consequences? I should have known that, yes. I really didn't think that that would happen again. But her own daughter, Christy, Ethan's half-sister, warned her that Yes, it could. I just told her that I was nervous that he might be drinking being at that house by himself under no supervision. How long prior to the crash was that told to her by you? A week. And that same week, Ethan's friend, Star Teague, says Tanya witnessed Ethan in the house with an open beer. Do you know for a fact whether Tanya saw y'all with beer sitting there? She saw us. Tanya wanted to come in and say, you know, I was always really against drinking and driving. But then when you say, what'd you do to enforce that? There was just nothing. Zero. Do you recall ever disciplining Ethan for anything? Sometimes I would take little things away from him or we would just discuss the problems. When's the last time you recall disciplining Ethan for anything? I don't remember. It's hard to discipline a kid when he isn't always under the same roof. Remember, the couches were letting Ethan play grown up by himself in the Burleson house. In your mind, it was okay to let a 16 year old kid stay at the Burleson Retta house by himself without anyone present, correct? That 16 year old kid, however foolish that it may have been, he seemed pretty responsible. Was there always alcohol then when you were at the Burleson location? Mm -hmm. Not always, no. Most of the time? Most of the time, yes. If there's alcohol, most of the time there's drugs as well. Yes. You betcha. Ethan rattles off a list of drugs shocking for anyone, much less a 16-year-old. I'm taking Valium, Hydrocodone, Marijuana, Cocaine, Xanax, uh, Vyvanse. I think I tried Ecstasy once. Pretty sure that was it. Which brings us back to that deadly June night. And what was your plan? Uh, just gonna have a couple people over and drink. Do you recall any sort of text exchange with your mom the night of this crash? Yes. Uh, she just sent me a text, you know, don't be out late and don't drink and I'll you know, be drinking and driving. She was asking what we were all doing, and he was telling her, and she knew that we were drinking. She was like, well, just don't drink and drive. That was certainly thoughtful, but by now, Ethan had years of experience blowing off the rules without facing consequences. Why should tonight be any different? Do you remember pulling out of the driveway? Not really. I had, like, just like a picture in my head of just turning out of the driveway, but that's, I said it. What's the next thing you recall? Waking up handcuffed to the, the hospital bed. 
And after all this, Ethan's father actually distances himself from the affluenza defense he paid for. I don't even know that I believe affluenza is real. 16-year-old Ethan And Cowell. despite all the terrible media coverage... Tony's blame. ...over coddling by his wealthy parents. His parents maybe need to do a little talking as well. Even being branded the worst parents ever, Fred defends his family. I don't think we're profoundly dysfunctional. Did you teach Ethan that wealth bought privilege? I don't believe if I ever intentionally tried to teach him that. Did you teach Ethan that indeed because your family was wealthy that the rules didn't apply to you? Mm, never. The McConnells are eager for a civil jury to hear every word of this testimony. I feel like it needs to be done. Why? Because I haven't seen any punishment. But the couches are as determined to avoid another courtroom as they are to avoid our cameras. Mr. Couch, stay with us. We return to 2020's A Case of Affluenza. It's been nearly two and a half years since that June night when so many lives intersected on this road. And the victims' families, like Eric Boyles, who lost his wife and daughter right outside his house, remain convinced that this was an accident in name only. This was not an accident. This, this was not a good kid that just made a poor decision. This event was going to occur somewhere. It was just a matter of when it was going to occur and who it was going to affect. The search for justice has been an exercise in frustration, not just for them, but also for prosecutor Richard Alpert. What would justice have looked like to you? Justice would have been the system doing something to Ethan that life hadn't done to him up to that point, which is hold him accountable. Did you ever think of prosecuting the parents? We did. We, if there was a way to do it, we would have done it. Um, being a bad parent, unfortunately, is not a crime. As the one remaining civil case, the one brought by the McConnell family, worked its way through the courts, the judge from the criminal case decided to call it quits. Gene Boyd, the judge who handed down that controversial sentence, retired last year. Forgoing a run for re-election, she declined our request for comment. Her career in the public mind will always be defined by this case. Thousands of cases, but... Affluenza is the one people will remember. Yes. These days, Ethan is back working at his dad's sheet metal plant. We reached out to Ethan and his parents, but they had no comment. So we headed back to Texas to track him down ourselves. It was no easy task. We checked out the fancy Fort Worth house, but no answer there. Anybody home? So we went to the family business. We've been staking out Ethan and Fred's business, which is right across the way for about a week now. But they're not like regular people. They don't come to work at regular hours. They don't keep regular hours. So it's been really hard finding them. When that steel gate slid open and Ethan finally emerged, he clearly wasn't looking to talk. You don't answer a couple questions? But if you take a closer look, that's him right there. The good news, he's not driving abiding by that part of the probation. And just as the trial in the McConnell case is about to begin, another stroke of good fortune for Ethan. Lucas and his parents have had a change of heart, settling instead of moving forward with the trial. The last time that we met, you were very serious about taking this all the way. What happened? I think we've succeeded, at least a little bit. I never saw the child drink. I don't think we're profoundly dysfunctional. By showing the world those deposition videos, the McConnells believe they're showing the couches for who they really are. By you guys coming here and focusing attention on this, this has made it where we've achieved our goals of, you know, letting the world hear about this story. Couches don't want to talk. They will probably never hear their side of the story or hear them apologize. I think when you have things that that you want to hide, you tend to stay in the shadows. It's time to move on. I mean, my family's been through a lot. These days, the McConnells are teaching Lucas to drive on the same roads Ethan Couch once tore through. And Eric Boyles is still in his home, even though reminders of that hideous night are just outside his front door. You know, a lot of people would ask, why stay here? People have asked, how can you how can you come back to the house? How can you come there? And, and actually, people may not understand this, but there's probably a little bit of peace knowing where they were. This is where their last moments were. 
Faith, family, and friends is the only thing that gets you through it. Shauna Jennings, the widow of youth pastor Brian Jennings, believes her husband did not die in vain. His purpose, she says, could be to reach the very person who took his life. Maybe this is a wake-up call or that somehow Brian's life can show him a different life that um, he could have. For her, the time for outrage has passed and the time for forgiveness has begun. It's a daily decision um, to forgive. Because it's so easy to hate, isn't it? It is, but that doesn't do anything except punish you. I can't live my life um, bitter or angry. That's our program, but keep the conversation going. Who do you think is more responsible, Ethan or his parents? Let us know on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Mueller. Thanks so much for watching and from all of us here at 2020 and ABC News. Have a great evening.